saying yes to God when you have to wait. Do you ever feel like one of those kids? Do you ever feel like the one in the end who finally got the two and just jumped them both in his mouth at the same time? You know, we're not much good at, at waiting. It's not something we would choose to do. Whenever we want to go somewhere, we want the quickest and shortest way. When you go through Walmart and you're getting ready to check out, how many of you are like me? You, you go down the lane and you're looking for the shortest, quickest line to go through. And no matter which line you pick, you always pick the wrong one. You, you know what I've discovered? Maybe you have too. That, that if you're at, and, and Tony, I'm, I'm learning from you on this one. If, if you're at the red light at the dry ridge exit, when that thing turns green, you have to go right now or you're going to catch the red light on the other side. But if you take off right when the light changes, you can get across and get through the other one before it turns yellow. So I, I, I kind of see if I can beat Tony on the line on that one. But if you were to ask my kids, honestly, what a yellow light means, they would not tell you slow down because it's about to turn red. They would tell you speed up because you can get through before it turns red. And I think I'm not the only one that's guilty of that here this morning. In fact. I'm probably almost sure of it. Somebody told me that the average person will spend six months of their life at a red light waiting for the light to turn green. I think that's probably a little low when it comes to me. I seem to get caught by more than that. But, but, but we're always waiting for something, aren't we? In school, we're waiting for the bell to ring. At work, we're waiting for the weekend. On Sunday morning, we're waiting and watching our watch and hoping that the preacher's going to get us out on time. We're always waiting. And the truth is, none of us are very good at it. Every parent who's ever been on vacation with their kids in the back seat know the mantra. You're not 10 miles out of town, and one of them starts in with what? Are we there yet? And we tell them, be patient going to take a little while, sit back, enjoy a show. But let's be honest, you, you never outgrow it. We all want to get there in a hurry. If you don't believe me, then ask yourself, when, when you push the button on an elevator, if the door doesn't open, how many times do you push the button? Now, now to be honest with you, do you really think that the elevator is going to get there any quicker by you pushing that button over and over and over again? No, but we're all in a hurry. We want to get there faster. As a matter of fact, let me prove how big a hurry you are in to you this morning. Let me give you a, a very short quiz, okay? This is just a, a simple true and false quiz. Keep track of your trues and your falses. Number one, it says, I've cut through a gas station to avoid stopping at a red light. Now, wives, don't point to your husbands on this one. But, but if you've done that, just, just keep track, true or false. Number two. I always have to know what time it is. Find yourself checking your watch regularly. Number three, in conversations, I always like to get right to the point. I don't like small talk. Number four, I become annoyed when the person in the checkout line in front of me chooses to pay by writing a check. My daughters say, you mean you really do that still? Yeah, I do sometimes. Number five, People who talk slowly really irritate me. Number six, I don't care what the food tastes like just as long as it's fast. Number seven, I often find myself finishing other people's sentences in their, my head before they're done. Do you ever do that? Number eight, I have a difficult... Uh, I have difficulty finding time for things like getting my hair cut or a checkup. And number nine, I'm timing the sermon right now to keep track of how much time you have left. We don't like to wait. Nobody does. It, it seems to go against our nature. And again, if you don't believe it's against the nature of people to do that, then tell me this. Why do we send packages by Federal Express we have a cell phone company called Sprint. We manage our personal finances on Quicken. 
We schedule our appointments on the day runner. We diet with slim fast, and when we swim, we wear speedos. It's just the way we are. But I want to be clear that that's not what God has in store for us. There are times when God wants us to learn to wait. And I can't imagine in my wildest dream that God would ever want somebody to wear a Speedo. Can you? That's the naive way he made us. And yet sometimes I think we miss God's plan. Sometimes I think we miss God's best for our life because... Well, we just don't want to wait. We don't like those seasons of waiting. And all of us in our lives find ourselves waiting for different things. We wait when we take our car to the shop for it to get fixed. We wait when we go to the doctor's office or the dentist's office. We wait in line to get out of the store. And we do well to learn to wait patiently. You know, some of the things we wait for in life really aren't all that important. Does it really matter whether it takes us two minutes or five minutes to get out of the store? Does it really matter if the, the, the red light's a little bit longer than we think it? Not really, but you know, there are some times when we wait on God, and when we wait on God, it's important that we learn to be patient. Because God has the best in store for us in life. You know, when, when we're waiting on God, it, it's important that we learn to, to obey. And that's important because there are a lot of people who are waiting on God for a lot of things in the world today. Some of us are waiting for God to speak. Others are waiting for God to provide. Some people are waiting for God to heal or waiting for him to put the pieces back together. Some of us are waiting for a child to come home or for our marriage to be mended. Waiting is never an easy job. And if we're honest with ourselves, some of us just don't like it. But at one time or another, and I'm just like you, we find ourselves sitting in God's waiting room. And you know, the amazing thing is when we're sitting in God's waiting room, if we would just take a look around, what we find is there, there are a lot of people in there that you couldn't even imagine. As a matter of fact, we're going to take a look this morning at David. David was sitting in God's waiting room. If, if you've got your Bible, open it to 1 Samuel this morning, and we're going to look at the 16th chapter of that book. In the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel, uh, I want to give you a little bit of background. David is about 12 years old. He's out taking care of his dad's sheep. All of his brothers are at home with dad because there's a very important visitor coming to the house today, a man by the name of Samuel, the prophet. And Samuel is coming for a very important reason, but David and none of his brothers know exactly what it is. Samuel is coming to Jesse's house today to anoint one of David's brothers to be the next king of Israel, or at least that's what everybody thinks, or what Jesse thinks. And so Samuel shows up at Jesse's house, and and Jesse begins to parade his boys in front of him. And the oldest goes by first, and he's a big, tall, scrapping guy. And God said, no, that's not the one. And so the second son passes. God said, not him either. And the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And finally, the last child passes in front, and God says, no, it's not him either. And the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11, this. So Samuel asked Jesse... Are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse said, but he's tending the sheep. Jesse doesn't even think this kid's significant enough to even bring in for the selection. Samuel said, send for him, and we will not sit down until he arrives. And so David comes on the scene, and in verse 12 it tells us this. So he sent and had him brought in. And he was ruddy and fine in appearance and handsome in features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. So on that day, in front of his dad, in front of all of his brothers, 12-year-old David is anointed the next king of the people of Israel. 
But here's the amazing thing. God doesn't give him any timeline. God doesn't have any strategic plan laid out saying, David, this is, is how it's all going to happen. David has to wait. And while David's waiting, basically he goes back to doing exactly what he was doing before. He's anointed king, and the very next day his dad says, now go take care of the sheep. And David is out taking care of sheep again and waiting for his time, waiting on God's plan. And he's not waiting just a month or a year. He waits year after year after year. And he begins to learn something. When God has us wait, he's got a reason for our waiting. In fact, as a matter of fact, this is what we learn from God, that there is something that happens in waiting that's necessary in us becoming. There's something that happens that, well, we wait, that God is preparing us for, for what's coming. God actually sometimes is doing more in our life while we're waiting than, than he has planned for us in the future after we get there. And so it's important that we as Christians learn how to wait on God be, today because if you look around God's waiting room in the Bible, there are a lot of people in the past who have waited on God. Do you remember Abraham? We talked about him a couple of weeks ago. He's the one that God promised he would give him a, a child, a baby. He's 70 years old. His wife is 60. Doesn't seem very likely at that age, but God said it was going to happen, and so they waited. 30 years go by. Now Abraham's 100. His wife is 90. And nothing has happened yet. They've had to wait all this time until one day Sarah says to Abraham, do you think Medicare covers labor and delivery? Because waiting on God always brings about God's will. And then last week we talked, remember, about Moses. Moses who spent time in God's waiting room watching sheep for 40 years on the backside of a desert for, believe it or not, his father-in-law. Until after 40 years of shepherding sheep, God comes to Abraham and says, okay, now's the time for you to go lead my people out of Egypt to the promised land. Another person we see in the waiting room is Joseph. Did you ever think about this? When he's 17 years old, Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery down the land of Egypt. And for the next 13 years, he spends his life either being a slave in his master's house or because he's falsely accused of trying to attack his master's wife, he ends up in jail for half the time before God finally makes him the second most powerful man in the land of Egypt and he protects God's people from a coming famine. But he had to wait. And I guarantee that during that waiting, Joseph asked himself over and over again, what is God doing? And what happens to us while we're waiting is that we often find out that what we're learning while we're waiting is more important than what we're waiting for. Sometimes we say, you know what, I, I, I wish God would just get me that job I've been praying for. I've been praying for years, but that job's just never come along. And, and then you need to ask yourself, what did you learn while you were waiting for that job? Did you learn to depend on God? Did you have maybe a little bit more time to spend with your family? A friend of mine was telling me that he talked to a guy named Cliff in this church who had had a heart attack. And he went up to Cliff and he said, Cliff, how did you enjoy your heart attack? And Cliff said, what do you mean? How did I enjoy my heart attack? It almost killed me. I didn't enjoy it at all. And he said, then he began to ask him questions. Cliff, do you, do you and Mildred feel a little closer together now than you did before the heart attack? He thought about it for a minute and said, yeah, yeah, I guess we do. And he said, do you, do, do you enjoy each day now a little bit more than you did before the heart attack? He said, you know, I really do appreciate each day a little bit more. He said, do you hug your grandkids a little tighter than you did before you had the heart attack? He said, you bet I do every time I see them. And then he looked at him again and said, how'd you enjoy your heart attack? 
He said, Cliff sat there for a minute and said, I guess it did me a lot of good. You know, sometimes when we're waiting on God, it does us a lot of good because God is teaching us deep inside. But you know, I think the thing we hate most about waiting is when you're waiting, you're not in control. (laughs) Maybe that's why I hate red lights so much, because I never know when it's going to change, and it always takes longer than I think, and I'm just not in control. It's a humbling experience when we're forced to be dependent on God. David was 12 years old. God said, you're going to be king someday. But David didn't know how long it was going to take. And years go by, and and we come to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and now David's a teenager, and you know what kids are like when they're teenagers. And all of David's brothers are off at the war with Saul, but David's too young. He has to stay home, and so he becomes the go-between, taking supplies out to his brothers and finding out how things are going on out in the field. And, And one day when David is taking supplies out to his brothers, he sees this guy named Goliath. Now, Goliath is over nine feet tall. He's just a hulking guy. And he comes out and he challenges the army of Israel and says, send somebody to fight me. I mean, I'm a Philistine. You're Israelite. Send somebody out here. And if you beat me, we'll be your slaves. If I beat you, you'll be ours. David, here's the challenge. And in 1 Samuel 17, verse 26, it says, David asks, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Basically, he said, somebody needs to shut that guy up. And somebody needs to do it now. And he begins to look around at all these soldiers. And everybody's just kind of ducking their head. And David says, really? Honestly? Nobody is on God's side? No, nobody's going to step up here? Nobody's going to defend God. And then this teenage boy who's not old enough to be in the army yet says, well, if nobody else will, I will. And by this point, Saul's just desperate enough that he says, okay. But the first thing he tells David is, but you're going to have to have some armor, so I'll lend you mine. Now, now this is where what's really funny comes in, because David is probably 16, 17, he's 5'4", maybe weighs 130, soaking wet. And and Saul is 6'8", and weighs 250. And David tries to put on Saul's armor, and and to be honest, the the Bible almost makes it comical, because he says David tried to walk around, and he couldn't even walk in this stuff. And finally he turns to, to... to King Saul, and he says, I I can't fight in this stuff. i got to go with what I know. Do you know when I think we get in the most trouble as Christians? When when we try and fight the way the world fights. When, When the world says, here are the weapons you need to win the battle. Here's the way you need to fight the war. And we listen to them instead of listening to God. David said, I can't fight in armor like that. I'll just go with what I have. And all he had was a shepherd's rod, a slingshot, and five stones. The Bible basically said when Goliath saw his challenger, he laughed at him. He mocked him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 and 46, it says this, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And David takes run, off running right at him. And as he's running, he takes a rock out and puts it in his sling. And he starts to swing it around and he lets it fly. And everybody knows the story. The rock hit 
Goliath in the head. Goliath comes tumbling down. David runs up beside him and says, doesn't look like you're using your sword. Do you mind if I do? And he pulls out Goliath's own sword and cuts his head off with it. Several verses later, David is back in the presence of King Saul in his tent again. And it just happens to mention that he's still carrying around the head of Goliath. But there's a lesson here for us. Because David had been anointed king years earlier. He's not king yet. But he's not sitting around waiting for God to work. He's actively following God while he's waiting. He's stepping to the forefront, and if God asks him to do something, he's willing to say yes. So here's what we learned from David this morning. When we are in God's waiting room, we need to wait actively. You know what I see a lot of times when when we're waiting? We just sit around on our hands, don't we? We're just, what do we call it? Killing time. That's what you do at the doctor's office. That's... That's what you do when you're waiting for your car to get work done. You, you sit around and you pick up a magazine that you would never read usually, but now you find yourself thumbing through it because you have nothing else to do. You're just burning the clock. And sometimes, for some reason, we think that's the way we should wait on God, too. That, that God just expects us to sit around and wait for him. But that's not what we see with David. David said, I'm not king yet, but I'm not going to waste the time between now and when I am king. When God gives me the opportunity, I'm going to step up. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to say yes to God in the meantime. And I think that's important for us as Christians to catch on today. When you're waiting on God, do not wait passively. If you're looking for a job... Don't sit at home and say, boy, gee, I I, I can hardly wait till God sends that job my way. You get out and do something about it. You fill out the resumes. You you put in the applications. You put yourself in a position where God can give you an opportunity to move. I mean, let's be honest, we don't do that with food, do we? When you're sitting in the living room and you're watching TV and you're hungry, do you say, boy, I sure hope God sends a sandwich my way soon. I'm starving. No, you get up and go to the kitchen and you make the sandwich. Now, God provided the food, but you got to do something about it. And so with David, we see him putting himself in a position where, where he can glorify God while he's waiting. where he can be active even during this waiting period. Let, let, me, let me close with something this morning that I, I really found humorous a while back. There, there, there's a book out, maybe you've read it, maybe you haven't, but it's called Cat and Dog Theology. Now, now I love this book because it pretty much confirms what I always thought about cats and dogs anyway. But what it says is when we live our life, we live it in one of two ways. We're either like cats or like dogs. And what it comes down to is this. A a, a dog will say to his master, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me, you must be God. Well, a cat, and this is what I agree, a cat will say to his master, "You you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me, I must be God. True? And basically, basically the, the premise of the book is this. God, or dogs will say to his master, I'm here for you. I'm here to do what you want me to. But a cat will say to his master, you must be here for me. A cat says, you exist for me. A dog says, I exist for you. And basically, the writer of the book says there are really only two ways to look at life. There's meology. 
Meology is kind of what the cat goes through. It's saying that God is my waiter. God is my butler, and I put in my order, and God takes care of me because I'm so important. And the other way is called theology, which says God is on top, and my responsibility is to do everything that I can to serve him. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't answer our prayers. It just means that while we're waiting for him to answer, we still continue to serve him and do everything he's asked us to do. And so the question is, which are you living this morning? What kind of life are you living today? Are you living with meology? Where you're sitting back saying, well, well, God said he'll take care of this, and so I'm just going to sit here and do nothing until he dies. Or are you living theology and saying, God will take care of this, but until he does, I need to continue to serve him and walk with him day by day. I think every one of us knows which one is right today. But the question is, what are you living? Are you willing to step out today and really say this morning, God is in charge? And I may not all have everything I want or everything I need today, but I'm going to trust him to take care of me. And while I'm waiting, I'm going to walk with him day by day. We're going to offer an invitation this morning. Maybe today's the day you need to step out and say, you know what? I've been living for myself for a long time now, but today's the day I need to put God first. Today's the day I need to put him on the throne of my heart and follow him instead of following myself. If you need to make a decision like that this morning, why don't you make it today while we stand and sing our invitation? Thank you for your kind attention this morning. Just a, a few things today. There's an elders meeting this afternoon at 2 o'clock here at the church. Board meeting tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, don't forget, small groups are beginning this evening here at the church. And our Awana uh, will be kicking off at 5.30 tonight with their carnival and their sign-up. And that will be downstairs in the fellowship hall area. So come on back for that tonight. Is there any more you want to say about it? Okay, we, need, we, we still need a few more people to volunteer to help out for the booths tonight. But we'll have it all set up. Yeah. We'll just be waiting for them to get here tonight at 5.30. It's easy booths, just games. Okay. Easy stuff. Yeah, things like uh, watching them pick up a duck. I mean, it's really not hard, right? 
All right. And don't forget to sign up. Yes, sign oh. up if you would like to be a part of the Christmas choir with Mount Pleasant Church. And one more thing, the bell people who are doing the bell song for next week, including drummer, guitar, everybody, we're going to meet up here just like 15 minutes right after the service. Okay. Yes. All right, one more thing. Don't forget, 180 next Saturday evening at 5 o'clock. We had a great first meeting last night and want to invite you all back to take part in that service next Saturday night at 5 o'clock. Joanne's in the back. Okay, we need cookies and or brownies for tonight. All right. Somebody call Joyce Bishop when you get home, okay? All right, cookies and or brownies tonight for our Awana kickoff. Any other announcements? If not, let's close together in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for training us and bringing us up in the way we should be. And Father, sometimes that doesn't happen as quick as we want it to. But help us to learn while we're waiting. Help us to learn to wait actively, to, to serve you day by day, to do our best to each day say yes to you and what you've called us to do today, knowing that you have an ultimate goal for our life. Bless each one of us this week. Help us to serve you each day, we pray in Jesus' name.